Well, good evening, everybody. We are set and ready to roll tonight. Got a big webinar tonight. We're about to crank up. And tonight's webinar is how to achieve your winning lower body in under 30 minutes. Now, the reason I put 30 minutes in this front slide is simply because that's literally how long it's going to take to start noticing a difference. You can make a change that fast if you execute what I'm about to teach tonight correctly. So a lot of people say, well, who are you? What have you done? What are your credentials? I, I, I used to get that a lot. I don't anymore. Here's a uh, real quick rundown. Uh, I'm a, I was a full scholarship football player and strength coach in college. This is me right here. This is from 1998. We played Florida State in this game. We actually beat them uh, 24 to 7 back in 98. And uh, physical transformation, I lost 50 pounds when I got done playing ball. From there, I was a private sector personal trainer for 10 years. And uh, then, or during that time, actually, I had 24 articles published on at the time, the highest pain fitness website in the world. And when I say highest pain, all I mean is they paid their writers and contributors more than any other uh, fitness based website. And they still do to this day. And I've had over 200 successful client case studies, which a lot of them you can see on my website with the social proof. And so on tonight's talking points, this is what I want to go over. And I'm going to explain why I have this photo here in a minute. So tonight's talking points, number one, the, we're going to identify what the number one problem is, which you have to fix before you can attain the winning lower body. All right. And it might be more than one problem. Number two, your hobby is hurting you. What you, what is your hobby? It's what you love to do, the activities you enjoy, the Oftentimes, what people's hobby in the fitness game is oftentimes what's hurting them. Starting at ground zero. And starting at ground zero doesn't mean you're out of shape. It doesn't mean you're a couch potato. Oftentimes, the people that are in the gym six days a week killing themselves, they need to start at ground zero. Indicator exercises. If you Once you do these two or three exercises, which I'm going to show you, you'll be able to easily identify the deficiencies you have. And training economy improvement. What is your training economy? It's the bang for the the bang for your buck that the exercises provide that you do. And I'm going to go over the top two exercises. And you want to have a very high exercise or training economy. The higher that is, the less exercises you have to do, the less time you have to spend in the gym, and the better results you get. Now, if you look right here, this, this is, I had her like eight years ago, this client, and I, I know these photos are not quite at the scale. I get that. But with that being said, she still lost four inches off her waist. It was only about six pounds of actually scale weight, but the fat in her leg did Tremendously, and she was someone. This is why I picked her, is that she was someone that that had the culprit of these the problem that needed to be fixed. And by fixing this culprit in her her legs, I know it, it's hard to tell a big difference here, but this is after two months. Um, she she did make, and this is not a competitive athlete. This is not a. This was just a housewife. She was 44 at the time, but by just fixing this, it it kind of lit the fuse, so to speak, to changing everything else, if that makes sense. So that's why I plugged her in, because she was someone that had this issue, which I'm about to go over right now. So fix the foundation. What, what is what is the number one problem that 93, 97% of women have? Number one, the number one culprit of lagging lower bodies are extremely weak hips, specifically the gluteus medius and minimus. Now, the gluteus medius is right here. These are superficial muscles within the hip region. The gluteus medius, you cannot see the gluteus minimus, but we'll get to it in the next image. Okay, but right here, this is the gluteus medius, and it is involved with uh, 
abduction of the femur. And the, the femur is the thigh bone. Abduction is when you move it away from the body. So if you move it out, a b duction, abduction. Now, a deduction or adduction is just simply moving it towards the body. That's not what we're talking about. The glutus medius and glutus minimus are responsible for moving the femur away from the body, abduction. Here's why that's important to know. We've all seen people, and 97, 95% of women have this problem. Whether they're a couch potato, they're thin, they're fat, they're obese, or they're fit. It doesn't matter. If they squat down, their knees will pinch in, some very badly and some just moderately. When that happens, when their knees pinch in, that's a red flag. That that's clearly indicates they have a weak glutus medius and minimus. All right? So you've got to fix those. Now, this will hinder all muscles of the lower body. Quads, the abductor group, um, glutes, glutus maximus, this will hinder the development and the recruitment and the activation of, of obviously the hips, the glute region, but the entire lower body. If you don't fix this, you're never going to get there. You've got to fix this to give yourself a fighting chance. Now, before I go any further, let me say this right now. Just because somebody, I've seen women, in fact, I don't want to get too off topic, but I've seen super hot, super fit bikini or figure competitors that, oh, she has a perfect body, perfect butt, perfect glutes, perfect legs that have very weak hips. So just because you are hot doesn't mean you automatically have strong hips, okay? Let me be very clear on that. And we're going to touch on that way more in the webinar. Now, this just gives you a better look at This is a, uh, a superficial view. This is the glutus minimus, so you can't see it, or you can't really feel it, rather, if you poke your butt. But as you can see, this is the glutus maximus has been sliced open right here. Or here's another view. So you can, it's in the, the glutus medius is underneath and to the outside of the maximus. So these two muscles here, it's not a big deal. Just these two are here are what we need to strengthen. And it's really popular now, not as much as it was a few years ago, but we've all seen the barbell where somebody will put a barbell on their lap and drop their butt down to the floor and lay on a sideways on a bench and pop their butt up in the air. That does not work, these two sections of connective tissue. That works the gluteus maximus and doesn't work the gluteus medius and minimus. So you have people that can do a bunch of weight there, but their knees buckle in when they squat and they can't figure out why. You've got to strengthen these before you strengthen the gluteus maximus. I don't know much more how clear I have to make that, but but pencil that in. Make a note of that. Okay. Now, this is big. This is big. This is number two. That's the number one problem. The second problem is exercise fanatics. And when I'm referring to exercise fanatics, it's your sport or your hobby is holding you back. All right. Let's talk about this. The number one sport or hobby that holds exercise fanatics back from the winning lower body is spinning or cycling, same difference. Cycling, you're actually on a bike, on the track, on the course, on the road. Spinning, you're in a class, on a stationary. And jogging. Those are the, num the, the top two hobbies or sports or activities that will negate, destroy, hold back your, they're the culprit for holding your back the winning lower body. Now let's talk about why. Okay, let me be clear on this. I'm not referring to somebody in a hypothetical scenario that might bike or spin or jog once or twice a month, but also performs corrective exercises, specific uh, prehabilitation movements, foam rolls, gets deep tissue work. I'm not talking to some, I'm not referring to that person because quite honestly, that person most likely doesn't exist. But in a hypothetical scenario where somebody already had, did not have any deficiencies in connective tissue or their structural postural issues, and they did these precautions, 
and they only did this, the cycling or the jogging or whatever once or twice a month, they could get away with this. A lot of people love to throw out exceptions to the rules, so I'm going to toss you guys a bone. In that situation, I don't think it exists anywhere in the, in the world, but if it did, you could probably get away with it. But with that being said, let's move forward. The number one problem is that it exacerbates any existing mobility and tightness, tight pecs and kyphotic shoulder position. If you look at this image right here, a kyphotic shoulder position usually happens most, it's most, most women are predisposed to very tight pecs. The pec or the pectorialis, major and minor, are the muscles of the chest. They are underneath the breast. And what they do is if they're tight, they're going to pull the shoulders forward. And most women, and men too, especially people that sit at a desk all day and are hunched over, they have this problem. They have tight pecs that pull the shoulders forward, and they have weak traps and rhomboids, which are the muscles of the upper back. Now, as you can easily see, in the spinning class or cycling position, this is very problematic. You've got women with already tight pecs or men, but especially women, and they're in a hunched over position with the kyphotic. I just explained that. It's the rounding of the upper back, and it's the protraction of the shoulder blades. That's a bad, bad very bad postural position to be in. You're like, well, what does this have to do with the lower body? We're going to get to that in a minute. We're going to get to that. Just bear with me now. Follow me on this. Stay with me. So you have people that or already have the chip stacked against them. Now, it also promotes very tight hip flexors. You're hunched over. When you have tight hip flexors, it pulls the pelvis forward. That's not good, and it can screw up the glutes, okay? So I know people think spinning class is good for the glutes. It is not good for the glutes at all, all right? Now, moving forward, cardiovascular efficiency improves, thus resulting in fewer calories burned. When you're running, I'm not talking about a, a couch potato that gets up and cycles for 30 minutes. I'm not talking about your second week in spinning class. I'm not talking about someone that goes for a jog once every three months. That's not what we're talking about. People that are cycling 50 miles four days a week, are running eight miles four or five days a week, 10 miles every other day. What happens is, because when you first go for a run or a cycle or a spin class for the first time, or even, you know, the first time in a, what happens is your body is going to sweat like crazy. You're going to be gassing for air. Your muscles are going to burn like crazy. But after the fourth or fifth time, yeah, you'll certainly sweat. It'll be tough, but it won't be as tough. Your body won't burn as many calories. Your body adapts. What if you've done it for five or six years? How many calories do you think, not that you should be counting calories, but to, to my point, how many calories is your body going to do the 18th year, not the 18th year, but the seventh or eighth year, the third or fourth year you've been going for a run now? And you say, well, well, I, I, I run further now. That makes it worse. Or I, I, I ride a different course. You're missing the whole point. You're missing the entire point if you by asking that question. Your body is your cardiovascular efficiency becomes more cardiovascular efficient. It adapts and you don't burn nearly as many calories. Therefore, you have a greater chance to store body fat. And when you want to burn body fat, when you finally get to a point where, wow, I need to burn some body fat, it makes it very difficult because there's very little you can do to stimulate your cardiovascular system on that bike or running. And you've got to find different ways to do it, which is where I come in. Now, we're going to take a step back. And I, I debated on whether to put this slide first or the one you just saw first. And I went back and forth, and I intentionally put the other one first so that you would see the physical problems associated before I got into, in the fat burning problems, before I got into what this slide is. 
these are common excuses I get, and I got you got. I've done numerous webinars on this, articles, uh, Facebook posts, and I always get a woman, and if, rarely a man, but usually a woman that's in her 30s or 40s. That gives you, these aren't 16 or 22 year old women. This isn't some 23 year old little foppish woman that just wants attention. These are like women in their 30s and 40s that say this stuff. And I'm going to give you, these are, these, I didn't, these aren't examples. Well, one of them is, but the rest are true quotes. But so and so does it. And their legs, abs, arms, or body look awesome. So and so does spinning. So and so does cycling. And she looks awesome. Her legs are perfect. Her body's perfect. Her shoulders look awesome. That's an, ex that, that's, that's an excuse that I get from these people. Just because somebody does something wrong and got good results, that doesn't magically make it okay. It's still bad. I don't do it to look good or for fat loss. I do it for fun and for health. Well, as I just clearly demonstrated, there's nothing healthy about it. It will improve your resting heart rate. That is it. It's not going to lower body fat. It's going to destroy your connective tissue. It's going to give muscular imbalances. It's going to deteriorate your joints. That, there's nothing healthy about that at all. I don't know where the health part comes from. And there's nothing wrong with looking good. And honestly, most people want to have the aesthetic benefits as well. Or they'll just say, I disagree. I love it. I mean, this is probably – and these are women that say this are like in their 30s and 40s. I don't know how you hold down a job. I don't know how you raise a child. I'm not even going to say debate skills. I'm just going to say when you have such rudimentary communication skills, the sky – if I tell you the sky is blue and you say I disagree, it's a fact. The sky is clearly blue. You can turn around and look at it. I just demonstrated – Clearly, the negatives of spinning, cycling, or chronic distance running. I just went over it. They're not up for debate. They're factual. They're factual. So when you disagree with something that I just proved to be correct, the sky is blue. Spinning causes a kyphotic body position, tight hip flexors. And you say you disagree, you're proving your profound level of ignorance and your inability to communicate. Once again, these aren't 22-year-old, foppish, petulant little girls saying this. These are women in their 30s and 40s with kids. Now, I agree with you. You do love it. But to say you disagree with proven imbalances that it causes, that's, that's beyond ignorance. That's, you're, you're dealing with a fool. And you're like, well, that's very harsh of you to say. I don't know what else to tell you. When someone tells you you are causing damage to your body. I, guys, I, I want to see you get better. I want to see you improve. And there's people that will just literally verbally spit in your face and say, no, you're wrong. This is what you're – this is what not only me, but, but I say you're up against. You know, We're here to get better, improve, and we're up against people that don't want to get better. They don't want to hear the truth. It's, they, they don't want to get better, but – you got to fight through it, and I'm going to keep bringing the heat. Or they'll say, I've lost 20 pounds. It works for me. Well, if you're a couch potato, and you eat ice cream and cookies every day in a small amount, and you work out, ride a bike, jog, whatever, and you weigh 300 pounds, you're going to lose some weight. That's an extreme example, but the point is, even if, if you're out of shape enough, you can do anything and get results at first. And then what happens is, this is what happens to these people. I'm going to tell you in a minute. So these four examples, not the, the four, but the bottom two, or the first one and the last two, I'm going to give you examples of those, of what happens to that person that doesn't buy in and keeps trying to do it over time. I'm going to, we'll get to that in a later slide. Now, you say, why are people so passionate about it? Why do these women get hooked on chronic bike rides? Cycling, spinning, and distance running. What? Where is the obsession? Why are they such fanatics? I'm going to tell you why. Number one, the social, recreational, and aspect of the group. A lot of these – I knew – well, I had a woman I trained two years ago. 
obese woman. She did spinning class several days a week with her groupies, her cronies. And of course, I said, get the heck out of that spinning class and start putting the right food in your mouth. And of course, her when you what you have is that the friends immediately took offense to that. And she felt ostracized from the group. And I know this because she posted on my message board in her client journal about how she just went on and on and on about her friends had ostracized her and she didn't feel part of the group anymore. And they just kind of did stuff without her now. And she lost two inches off her waist the first month. And she lost, I think, like two pounds of scale weight, but over four pounds of body weight, or I'm sorry, body fat. And she just, it was, it, it was, it just, it was almost like it didn't even matter to her. The group social support was more important to her than really burning body fat and getting into a much smaller size outfit. I'm telling you, the social of peers of doing stuff in your community or in groups is tremendous. And a lot of people, they just say, you know, they don't really believe it, number one. They don't believe that it's they have to give it up. But that's it. That's what compels them. That's what keeps them. That's what keeps them resistant to stopping doing it. Relaxation, mental and emotional. Now, I'll put these three here for a reason. If you look up here, someone's riding a bike by what looks like an ocean or a lake or a body of water at sunrise. And right here at sunrise as well. And they're riding down the road. Now, whether it's biking or, or it could be jogging, and I know this because I used to do it. When you're up and you run early morning and the sun is rising and you feel like the day is about to start and the sun rises, it's almost a spiritual experience. You've been running now for 10, 12, 15, 20 minutes in some cases. You've been cycling and you're on your 20th mile, whatever. You've got those endorphins are pumping and the sun rises, it's, it's almost a form of meditation. And if you've never done it, you're going to, I know you're laughing right now, but if you've been there, you know. And state in any, back in uh, 2000, 2001, and 2002. And I haven't done it since then. But yet and still, I can relate to this. And I can remember running, whether it was, it didn't matter the season, summer, winter, spring, or fall. It mattered not. Cold out, hot out, didn't matter. That sun peaks up, and you're out there, and you've got a head start on the day. And you, you feel good after you run. You feel good after you cycle. You know, your heart rate's up. You feel good, but it's not that good for you, and it's going to hold you back from your goal. But it's that spiritual relaxation, mental, emotional meditation you get when you do it that is extremely compelling. It's almost addictive. It feels good. It's like it's like your special time of the day. Just you, you. What was that movie? Me myself, or that that phrase? Me myself and I. It's me myself and I. Just you, you yourself, and and and, and all together, all alone. Throw in the endorphin rush, and when you exercise, not when you do sprints so much, or your, but when you do long duration chronic exercise, long duration steady state, you get what's called the endorphin release. It's a chemical high. It's addictive. And you get that. Okay. Exercise fanatics. Let's keep rolling. Just, we're almost done with this, guys. Hang with me. Now, we've all seen this. Some women, women out there, first of all, people who have stubborn body fat pockets in their legs can actually become more stubborn and actually increase in size from jogging and or cycling. Let me explain. Most women are predisposed to having higher estrogen related or estrogen receptor sites, body fat, estrogen related body fat stores in their what? In their lower body, hips, thighs, legs. Okay. They have that. Now you take a woman like that and you let her cycle or spin class or jog for four or five months or four or five years and what happens is she does that, and over time, as she gains body fat, for the reasons we've already been over, those body fat pockets are going to increase. 
And when they increase, she's going to, do I do more spinning? Do I do more cycling? And if she's not doing cycling or running for fat loss, then if she keeps doing the cycling and keeps doing the running and jogging, the fat stores are only going to increase. And that's why you have to drop it all together to make them go away. And it's so tough for people. For, and I just told you why it's tough. We just went over that on the previous slide, why it's so tough for people. But that's what you've got to do. And you've got to cut it out, find a totally new stimulus, and you've got to nail your diet. And if you do that, you'll get fast results. I had a woman sign up with me. Let me go over this next slide first. Some women have tr oh, and if you have trouble, some women have little skinny chicken legs. Men too, but we'll focus on women now. And they just have trouble building up their legs. If this is you, then if you're doing cycling or jogging, jogging, it's going to make it even more difficult. So whatever your problem is, it's going to exacerbate your problem and make overcoming the problem more difficult. There was a woman I trained back in 2008. Did her, did her first figure show. She was uh, lean, you know, under 14% body fat. Pretty good genetics. Tall girl, probably 5'8". Um, uh, really good arms, delts, really good upper body. Her quads were crummy. She just had thin, uh, underdeveloped quads. They just, she just didn't have any quads. And very weak squatter. Um, but she loved to run. Oh, she loved to run. It's healthy. You burn fat when you run. Well, but you're never going to build your quads up running. Now, here's, here's what I'm about to get here, and I know I'm going to get this. And we've all seen the cyclist. We've all seen the spinning class instructor. And we've all seen that distance runner that just has big quads. Big. We've seen them. I've seen them that have awesome ripped legs. Okay, those are few and far between. And we're not talking about men. And there's a few women like that. There was a spinning class instructor that I knew like eight years, nine, ten years ago who had – she wasn't really ripped, but she was – had very muscular fit, we'll say ripped quads and legs. That's, she was predisposed to that already. That's not what this slide is about. This slide is about people that are the opposite, that are predisposed to thin legs, skinny legs, or fat pocket legs, or both. And if you have that, distance running and cycling, spinning class, is going to make it even more difficult to overcome that. Now, I have to keep going over this because it's like dealing with a can of mixed nuts. I've done webinars on this, numerous Facebook posts, articles out the wazoo, and I still get women. Their obligatory response when I tell them something is wrong is, look at so-and-so. She does trap. She does CrossFit. She does cycling. You're wrong. She does fasted cardio six days a week and still looks awesome. You're wrong. She, you can do spinning class and still be lean and ripped. You're wrong. Once again, these are not 18-year-old women. These are not 26-year-old foppish broads. These are 30- and 40-year-old moms with kids that behave this way. Why they can't, why do they don't have the cognitive ability to understand this, I don't know, but I'm going to try to, to nail this point home. They will find someone that still looks good in spite of training incorrectly. And they'll say that's really why they look good. They'll say the reason that person looks good is because they're doing spinning or they're doing cycling or they run eight days a week and claim they've proven me wrong. Let this sink in. Let, if you are a person with an IQ above Forrest Gump, you're going to realize the utter and absolute insanity of this. We've seen people we, – I know people that can eat McDonald's every day and still be ripped. There's going to be exceptions to the rule, God-given genetics and drug use. But even beyond that, just because you do something wrong doesn't make it – and you look good – doesn't make it right. And you know what's coming. You know, you, know, you know this is coming next. Now, and I'll get to that in a minute, but while, here's what they're going to do. I talked about this some four slides earlier. The people that won't back down and they keep fighting, you know, I disagree, I love spinning. Remember that line? They're going to keep doing what they've been doing and think it hasn't worked yet. It hasn't worked after six months or three years, but they're going to keep doing more and more and more and more of it. 
out of and what's going to happen is they're going to see the woman that does spinning class and cycling and distance running and is still ripped and they're going to think that's the reason she's ripped and so they're going to keep doing that and doing that and doing that and it's going to just flounder in frustration as they deteriorate their body and go backwards had a woman sign up with me let me get this next point first this is akin to saying just because you survive a car crash unscathed without buckling up doesn't mean it's a good idea not to wear your seatbelt. That's the exact that's that's the best analogy I can think of. If you get a good a favorable result by doing something wrong, that doesn't make what you did wrong a good alternative. Just because you can have an awesome figure by doing spinning class eight miles a day, blah 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 six days a week and you look awesome doesn't make all that stuff correct oh but it works for me it works in spite of it it works for you in spite of what you're doing not because of that and if you did it the correct way you look even better with less effort I had a woman sign up with me about two years ago and of course she didn't send in photos like I asked um, and she was a, a crazy marathon triathlon. I mean, she did everything. And I said, drop all this, follow my basic exercise program with your customized nutrition. And she emailed me back and said, oh, no, you're wrong. I Because I, what I had said to her, you know, follow it. You're never going to achieve your goals with, if you continue to overload your training this severely. And she's, oh, no, you're wrong. Watch this video here by Dr. So-and-so. And I don't even remember the doctor's name. It was, and it was a medical doctor. Some medical doctor had said, and which leads me to my next point. Don't ever, ever, ever take exercise or nutrition advice from a doctor. Never. Good gracious. They all follow the whole calorie equation. They're going to tell you the same thing Oprah or Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz will tell you, which is exercise more, eat less. That's their weight loss. That's any doctor's weight loss advice. Anyway, to the point, and I just she just never, I never heard from her again. But I had an, and there was another woman. Um, so many of them I've had, and I get women that'll sign up, and they are, they literally, they some of them might do triathlons, some might do marathons, some just are training addicts, and they are a train wreck. And I say to them. You're going to have to cut this out. You're going to kill yourself. And they can't. And you're like, well, Jeff, why won't they stop doing it? I just told you why they won't stop. Remember the slide with the people on the bike and the sunset and the sunrise, whatever it was? Emotional reasons, the chemical high, the group and social aspect. That's why it's so such a tremendous roadblock to get over. But they're killing themselves. It's like it's obviously not as bad as using crystal meth or some pernicious drug but you can make a similar analogy you know you it feels good when you use drugs when you get high when you do whatever you do so but they're very bad for you some worse than others but they have negative effects on you you're like well why would somebody ever do something that's bad for them same reason people take street drugs or recreational drugs it's the feel-good sensation it's the chemical high I mean, you guys know this. You guys are smart enough to connect the dots. So let's let's wrap this up here. Now, how do we get fit? Let's get better. Let, let's get better. Let's get better right now. So what are indicator exercises? I'm going to give you three mobility drills that will correct, will serve as corrective exercises. When I see a corrective exercise built in, by doing these indicator exercises, you will not only identify the weakness if there is one there but you will also improve it at the same time these are simple simple you're not going to believe how easy these are not going to believe it the first one is the trx squat We're the trx straps in gyms and studios and fitness clubs we've all seen them. if you don't have those use a rope if you don't have a rope use a flex band now look at the one where she's squatting down this is a pretty good squat i'd go about three inches wider with a stance Okay, I'd point the toes out a tiny bit more and the knees out a tiny bit more and sit about two inches deeper. Just go as deep as you can. And when you hold onto the straps, that's going to deload your body. What that means is that you can go a lot deeper and you can lean forward. 
uh, your head should be up. You don't have to look at the roof, but your head, your head needs to be neutral or at least neutral or up. And I go five reps wide stance, five reps moderate stance, and five reps right within the framework of the shoulder stance. Toes slightly out. The knees, the knees can go on top of the toes. That's, that's okay. And I would do that. That's, that's a number one. So if you're, that is a great, you're like, how? It's going to force you, it's going to force a deeper range of motion. And it's going to allow you and almost force your knees to stay out. Bulldog drills. I'm going to show these in a YouTube video in three slides from now. I'm going to show you these, so don't panic. Overhead squat. If you do an overhead squat, wide stance, hold a broomstick or a mop over your head. If you go to a gym that has those plastic I don't even want to call them barbells, but they're plastic bars. They weigh about two pounds, and they use them for body pump classes. Grab one of those. Hold it two inches behind your head or an inch behind your head. Wide grip and squat deep, head up, chest up. Okay? Do three sets of five of those or ten of those. If your knees pinch in, if you can't get very deep with them, then you know you have many problems. But overhead squat, I didn't say use a barbell. If you're strong enough to, after a few warm-up sets with a broomstick, try a barbell. Or try it a week later. But that is the number one, in my opinion, the number one mobility drill, warm-up routine, and to strengthen weak hips and posture and... Uh, scapular retraction, and even shoulders is the overhead squat. There's a million videos on YouTube. Type in overhead squat, and you'll get a million demos. I'm going to show you the bulldog drill in about three minutes. Bear with me. Now, the exercise economy. What is exercise economy? It's the bang for the buck you get from the exercises that you do. And I'm going to give you two drills. You're like, well, I don't have a gym membership. I don't even have a gym. It doesn't matter. You can do these at home. You're not going to believe how easy these are. Single leg squats off a chair, off a coffee table, off a sofa. Okay? I have videos up on my YouTube page. I have a great video up from about three years ago of a single leg squat. Okay? And I'll even uh, email one to you in a minute. I'll show you my email address. Now, Start slow, do three reps each leg, then lower the chair, lower the table, put some books on your coffee table, however you want to manage it. Do one or two reps for warm-up, then work your way down. And do this after you've done the three mobility drills. You don't need a gym for this either. A physio ball or stability ball leg curl. This is probably, you're like, well, that's not going to, oh, this will. I don't care if you are an Olympic sprinter an Olympia bikini champion, or an obese housewife, this is an awesome, awesome exercise. Both these are. They are phenomenal for strengthening the musculature that I just went over. The smaller the ball, the easier it is. This is almost perfect technique. I would extend the hips a little bit more. This looks very good. Feet all the way up onto the ball. Pause at top, slow down, do it again. There are a, there's uh, some really good demos on YouTube for this too. This is harder to find, but I have it on my page. Now, I'm about to go to my YouTube page, and I'm going to show a YouTube video on how to do the Bulldog mobility drills. And I'll even show the single leg squats too. Now, if you are not watching this live and you're watching a recording, I'm going to let you know right now that any meeting does not... Uh, YouTube videos, they do not show up on recordings. They just don't do it. Now, you can still hear me talk, and you'll see my webcam up, but you won't be able to see the video. It's not my fault. That's just how they do it. So I'm going to give my email address that you can email me for demos if you want, and I'll send them. Now, if you're like, well, I don't have a stability ball at a gym, and I work out at home, what do I do? 
double and single leg hip extensions or hip pop-ups rather, whatever you want to call them. In fact, you should do these anyway before you try these. These are simple. Do three sets of five each leg. Each week, add two reps. Do them three days a week. And I'll have a demo for these on the YouTube video. This is the email address. For those of you watching the recording, you can uh, email me and ask for videos. And for you watching live tonight and for on the recording, this is what it all comes down to, guys. Uh, I know I harp on this, but this is what it all boils down to. Take ownership accountability if you are lost and need help. Obtain the right map, your customized program, nutrition program. Read your program, meditate on your program, absorb your program, have faith, trust, and confidence in your program, follow, obey, and execute your program to precision, watch your program work, and sustain your program. This is my pyramid of success. I'm going to go to the YouTube video now.